ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome uh, to webinar organized by the Prague Center for uh, Middle East uh, Relations. Uh, the today's topic is uh, what's next for Iraq, uh, a sort of uh, a sort of uh, update on uh, recent developments in politics, security, and economics. Uh, uh, what I would like to uh, what I would like to cover uh, today is what is the state of uh, Baghdad Arab relations these days. What is the performance of the cabinet of the Prime Minister uh, Mustafa Al Kazimi? What are the prospects of genuine political and economic reforms uh, in Iraq uh, regarding corruption? How did the pandemic affect the economic and political situation, both uh, in federal Iraq and in the, in the Kurdistan uh, region in the north? And what should we expect on the pathway to early Iraqi elections that should be, at least according to the government's plan, be held uh, next year? Here with me, I have uh, three distinguished guests. Uh, Sajad Jiad, uh, visiting fellow with the Middle East and North Africa program at the European Council on Foreign Relations. Uh, Sajad is uh, Iraqi political analyst uh, based in Baghdad, uh, and he used to be managing director of the Al Bayan Center, uh, an Iraqi policy institute. Uh, such as main focus is on public policy and governance in Iraq. He also works on capacity building and of public institutions and civil society organizations through conferences, workshops, and various training uh, programs. He frequently publishes and is cited by uh, media as an expert commentator. Uh, and he also partnered with, uh, with extensive number of international organizations and think tanks to provide pretty much needed ground level research on Iraq and solutions for development related issues. Uh, our second guest is uh, Shivan Fazil, who is a researcher with the Middle East and North Africa program at uh, CIPRI uh, in Stockholm. He's uh, focusing on conflict analysis, building resilience and social cohesion and promoting uh, the rights of ethnic and religious minorities uh, in Iraq where he worked for over five years with various governmental and non-governmental organizations. Uh, he's focusing on democracy and governance, gender and youth, uh, particularly in uh, Iraq, Turkey uh, and Iran. Uh, prior to joining CIPRI, he worked as a project specialist uh, within the United States Institute of Peace uh, as an, a senior policy officer with uh, Oxfam and director of communications and research assistant at the Middle East Research Institute. And last but not least, uh, Aram uh, Kokoy is an independent economic and political commentator based in Suleimania in the Kurdistan uh, region of Iraq. Uh, he used to be a member of the governing council of the Coalition for Democracy and Justice, uh, which is political party, uh, which was a political party based in, uh, in uh, Iraqi Kurdistan. Prior to that, he was an instructor at American University uh, in Suleimania and Komar University for Science and Technology. Adam also worked in the past with the Middle East Research Institute as a junior research uh, fellow. He's a Fulbright alumni and he has MA in interdisciplinary studies with three areas of concentration, applied economics, sociology, and political science. So as you can see, we are having, uh, I believe distinguished guests that have very wide range of interest uh, of their research so they can provide us uh, sort of an update uh, what is going on in Iraq and most importantly what should we expect in the upcoming months in the upcoming year or two. So I would like to ask each of our speakers uh, to give an opening statement let's say 10 to 15 minutes each on the particular issues of uh, your choosing. And then we are gonna open a uh, floor uh, for uh, debate, uh, discussion. I also have several questions uh, that I would like to uh, ask you guys. Um, so uh, first of all, uh, we are gonna do the opening statements uh, of our guests. 
and then we are going to start the questions. Uh, considering that we are not that many uh, in this session, uh, simply uh, raise your hand uh, when you want to ask the question uh, in the discussion part of the webinar. Raise your hand, switch on your video and microphone, shortly introduce yourself and uh, give us your comment or uh, question. So without further ado, uh, I would like to ask uh, Sajad, uh, if I may, to give, uh, to give his uh, opening remarks. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Uh, good evening to everybody. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you here today and uh, I'm really excited to listen to you know, the discussions from the other participants and uh, what I'm sure will be some interesting questions as well. Um, as you guys all know, I, I think you're well aware of the difficulties that Iraq faces. Um, I would like to maybe categorize them into four or five uh, different areas just for ease of reference. Uh, the first I would say is uh, our internal domestic social issues, which uh, are concerning you know, the legitimacy of government, legitimacy of the political system that we have, the legitimacy of the parties that claim to represent you know, the, the people in Iraq, the post-2003 order. And I think that's being challenged through uh, protests that we've seen. I think um, it's going to be challenged through the next set of elections. Um, and it also is challenged through, you know, the disturbances that uh, erupt every now and then as a cause of economic failures or uh, lack of justice, for example, or political tensions that uh, break out in the open. And unfortunately, these uh, disturbances that I, I, I have seen uh, firsthand seem to be uh, occurring much more frequently now than in previous years. And they seem to be occurring in most of Iraq. Um, if you visit several provinces in the north and the south, you will find you know, regular protests now. And this was something that was quite uncommon maybe four, five, six, seven years ago, but it's actually now happening perhaps on a daily basis in many parts of Iraq. And I think the uh, ruling elites are facing a real challenge Yes, they may be able to win elections, but there is a lot of apathy in these elections anyway. And despite their hold on to power, there is a growing generation of people who do not believe in the post-2003 order. So that's what I would say is the first you know, challenge going forward for the country. The second um, is essentially the economic challenge. Falling oil prices, the effect of COVID-19 pandemic, lack of job opportunities for young people, the uh, you know, demographic challenge, the fact that our population grows by 1 million per year, that every year around 700,000 people are added to you know, the jobs list, people who are looking for uh, jobs. And the projections are that you know, in the next few years, the unemployment numbers will rise between three to five million. Um, and unfortunately, we just do not have the capacity in the system to give these young people their opportunities. And so when you um, put all this together, it makes it very, very difficult to be very hopeful about the economy. Um, and going forward, Iraq's you know, uh, reforms are not going to be able to move us away from oil very quickly. We are still going to be dependent on oil for several years to come, if not the entire decade. And because at the moment Iraq is so dependent on oil and oil prices you know, are uh, low relatively uh, compared to previous years, then the government has less income and then there's less to spend. And even the public sector payroll, which is essentially you know, uh, bloated, and uh, a benefit to many people who don't really do real jobs, but are paid just to keep essentially um, them happy. Uh, you, you'll see more and more uh, struggles around paying these people every month if you don't have enough income. So that's the second sort of challenge, the economic. The third, I would say, is related to the issues of you know, the security situation around ISIS, but also around all the armed groups uh, that are active in the country which claim to be uh, resistance and uh, trying to force the Americans out because they believe the Americans are occupiers and so on, but actually are a serious challenge to the government as well. And they are connected to political parties and political entities, which makes them particularly dangerous. Uh, so ISIS is clearly an external group in some respects. It is not represented politically, and there is much more um, support across the board in terms of tackling ISIS. But when it comes to these armed groups, it's much more difficult to form a consensus. And it's become very problematic in terms of what to do with it. And I think that's, that's going to be a huge issue going forward uh, for the country. Uh, Mustafa Kadhimi, the prime minister who's been in his post since May, has tried to show that he will uphold the rule of law, but essentially he has struggled to do so. 
Uh, and unfortunately, these armed groups are very, very powerful and are likely to keep their power unless something drastic happens in either next year's elections or if the government does decide to, you know, take them on um, military. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, element the uh, actions uh, playing out their um, political disputes inside the country the issues uh, around uh, Iraq's relations with the rest of its neighbors so with Saudi as a as a result of the US Iran tensions with Turkey for example uh, regarding in, internal issues especially in the Kurdistan region but also around issues like water and, and, and other resources and obviously the fallout from you know the the violence in, in Syria um you know continuing to affect Iraq and obviously aiding the movement of ISIS as well so you know you put these all together um and I haven't mentioned you know COVID-19 yet you just put those four categories and you can see there's a huge amount of challenges for for the country and at the moment we have a temporary government it's supposed to last until the next elections and there is um you know, apparently a reform of the electoral system. I'm not sure will lead to uh, real reforms and I'm not sure will lead to increased voter turnout. And I don't think the elections are going to be a, a solution to these problems. And at the same time, you have um, a lot of young people out there in the country who are very desperate, desperate for employment, desperate for opportunities, desperate to feel that they belong in this country and are increasingly um, starting to, to look at emigration to leave the country to go somewhere else because they don't believe they have the opportunities inside the country. So putting these all together and the fact that, as I said, COVID-19 is still around, uh, you know, we still, we're still struggling with it in, in, in all of Iraq. Uh, and the fact that um, when you put all these, while you have a temporary government, uh, it makes it very, very difficult to expect that suddenly the situation will improve. So my kind of short-term view is very pessimistic. I think things will get much more difficult for Iraq. But I would like to think in the more longer term view um, that hopefully with the generational change, hopefully incrementally when some of these reforms begin to kick in, um, that maybe we will see, you know, in five, 10 years time, some more changes that hopefully um, lead to significant reform for, for the population. Right now, I think a lot of people in this country are struggling, including those who are dependent on public sector payroll. Um, I think I'll, I'll just leave it there and I'm really looking forward to, to the questions. Um, and I'm pretty sure uh, there will be a lot of uh, debate uh, also because it coincides with the US presidential elections on what is going to happen with regards to whether President Trump remains in power or whether you know, Joe Biden becomes a president. And I, I'm, I'm very interested in that debate. I don't have the answers, but I'm looking forward to you know, uh, questions on this. So thank you. Sasha, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for your contribution. Actually, your, your last remark, uh, I'm going to ask uh, our uh, remaining two guests maybe to reflect on that a bit. I completely forgot about that, and I shouldn't have uh, what is going to happen uh, with the uh, US-Iraq's uh, policy or wider regional policy, we may even say, if it's going to be Biden or Trump. Uh, so. Uh, Anyway, I would like to give uh, floor to uh, Shivan, please, with your opening statement. Thank you. Well, um, thank you for having me. And of course, it's a pleasure to be acquainted to a lot of colleagues and uh, Iraq's, uh, or Iraq's brightest minds, like uh, uh, Sajjad and definitely my friend Aram. It's a pleasure. Well, I think uh, Sajjad made it very easy for, for me, especially by laying down a very good and nice framework, which I'm going to follow for, uh, for my intervention. Uh, I mean, the KRI situation, while being hailed as uh, the other Iraq for quite a big time of the past uh, uh, two decades, um, still actually resembles a lot of the general situation in, in Iraq or the rest of Iraq or Iraq uh, proper. I will focus on uh, a few areas. Uh, one of them is obviously uh, structural issues, politically and security wise. The KRI, despite uh, having uh, quite of an advantage uh, in the post 2005 Iraq order, uh, but still is uh, remain very, very divided 
across the two political zones led by KDP and PUK. And of course, all the problems that are relevant to both parties maintaining their uh, de facto Peshmerga forces, security apparatus, and not fully integrating not only security-wise, but also economically and administratively. That's why whatever issues happened, as we have seen across um, um, uh, the course of Corona pandemic over the last eight, nine months, a lot of actually uh, issues uh, and, and flashpoints that reflect these geographical and territorial divides across PUK and, and, and KDP. And that's why it's very difficult when we refer to uh, these kind of uh, evolving issues that we can basically elude or uh, hold the government to account when it comes to uh, some of these everyday issues, especially when PDK and KDP, KDP and PUK are maintaining a dominant role in everyday lives of, uh, of the population in the KRI. Another issue is, is obviously pertaining the, uh, the, the, the reverberations era of the uh, referendum for independence. This is, I believe it's still unfolding. It has, the dust is, is, is still settling from uh, what happened in 2017 with the referendum for independence and the pushback of the uh, Kurdish security forces in, in, in Kirkuk. And you have a different generation in the PUK that are on the ascent. Similarly, a uh, 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 similar generation or different people that are on the ascent on the KDP uh, or basically in Erbil and in Suleimania. And uh, more or less these two sides are and not cohabiting very often with each other and they are pulling uh, each towards one another at the expense of the rather cool or cooler and more pragmatic heads and and that's why it brings to the you know it's a, it's a limitless test for the uh, coalition of uh, or the ruling coalition of KDP and PUK that has that have been uh, governing KRI uh, over the last uh, two decades and a half or since 2003 more specifically since the unification of uh, the two administrations. And economically, uh, KRI obviously is, is, is experiencing uh, one of its uh, bleakest cycles of economic bust after 2014. Um, basically, the, the, the oil uh, revenue disputes with Baghdad that was temporarily resolved with Baghdad in 2019. But this time around, Iraq itself is facing a lot of uh, severe economic challenges with basically if previous governments in Baghdad were uh, asking uh, KRG to sell its oil through SOMO, this is not no longer a priority of the current government in Baghdad or even the future governments in Baghdad because uh, Iraq is part of oil uh, OPEC plus agreement. They have to basically uh, cut their exports in order to uh, give uh, some space for oil prices to recover. And that means KRG, KRG's oil is no longer that uh, indispensable or that viable for either Erbil or for Baghdad. That's why we've seen negotiations stalled at, at points uh, or when they resume actually, Baghdad is asking no longer only about uh, from uh, oil share from Erbil, but also uh, custom revenues and, 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 and domestic revenues uh, and so on and so on. And, and, and we have seen that the KRG has not been able, it's, a, it's actually a recurrent theme that uh, over the last uh, year and certainly during uh, the, la the years between 2016 and 2019, KRG is not able to pay its civil servants in time or even in full. And that basically it has affected uh, uh, the middle class because a big portion of uh, KRI are either on the in, informal economy, which obviously severely impacted because of uh, lockdown and uh, uh, COVID-inflicted economic uh, crisis. Uh, and, and, and the rest are middle class or salaried employees, which are not getting their salaries in time or not in full. So that's another uh, basically a, a point to explain how economically are people paying uh, Heavy, heavy price. And then it brings me to another uh, point, which you would say, well, if the situation is more or less resembles the situation in Iraq proper, why we don't see popular uh, protests or mass protests as we see in the in rest of uh, Iraq? Well, maybe a few points to explain that. First of all, I would say uh, the KRG, especially under the current uh, uh, government, have been more uh, assertive or more kind of uh, uh, pro approaching a heavy-handed approach towards any forms of 
uh, dissent precluding or actually even preempting uh, protests uh, from springing up. The largest protests that we have seen in KRI uh, can, can take us back to March 2018 when they actually managed to force the government. It was the, I would say, one of the few KRI-wide protests that forced the government to uh, relax some of the uh, austerity measures that were in place, especially salary saving mechanism that were only KRG at that time was only paying a third of, of, of its employees salaries every month. Um, so obviously a heavy handed approach towards uh, any forms of dissent as we have seen uh, Corona outbreak and uh, restrictions uh, have basically also uh, been a blessing in disguise for the government by basically um, uh, making it uh, almost impossible for any sorts of uh, expression of free speech and uh, free press, including, and, and as we see that more and more uh, activists and journalists are picked up and detained without arrest warrants or without any kind of legal grounds uh, uh, for that. And maybe the last point that I want to make, I don't know how much time I have, maybe a couple more points that I want to make. and. Basically, one of the, the things that uh, they were previously not a big concern in, in, in respect to the KRI is that we had kind of a marriage of convenience between the two ruling parties when they were, for example, economic crisis, political crisis, or even security challenges facing KRG. You would see that the bigger heads of KDP and PUK meeting behind closed doors and, I don't know, reaching some sort of agreement. and and taking those agreements to the government or to the parliament and getting a blessing. I think that uh, uh, this is no longer, uh, a, 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 or what my understanding is, this is no longer a possibility where uh, basically a lot of people in the PUK are sidelined or promoted in, in, in a sort, but definitely reduced uh, their clout or their agency. And the same thing can be said uh, for some people within the KDP, basically people that were able to reach out to the other side are kind of sidelined or no longer hold sway in other camps. And in respect to um, the last point that you were asking us to reflect on, the US elections, basically Iraq is, 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 is one place where the US election is the most important outside the America, outside America. I think this is a very uh, crucial point, but I would I would basically like to put out that there is a regardless who is going to be a president in the United States, while there will be some caveats, but I think both Democrats and Republicans have a commitment issue in Iraq. And I don't think either camps are willing to leave large troops or definitely uh, missions uh, beside in, in Iraq or in Erbil, uh, in KRG. But maybe with the only difference is that um, a democratic uh, president might restore uh, and give a lot of chance for diplomacy and multilateralism. And hopefully uh, the next State Department uh, uh, will have more, uh, I don't know, free hand or more space to maneuver and reach out and give diplomacy a chance and hopefully bring Iraq uh, out from this, uh, basically being in this gridlock or being this uh, US and Iran tension. So maybe that's the only thing that I, that I see in, in, in regards of US elections being uh, in, in, in reference to Iraq. And maybe, maybe um, a, a democratic president might be more kind of, uh, uh, you know, it will stand up to, to Erdogan. And of course, Turkey's uh, incursions in Northern Iraq and in Northeast of Syria and all the other parts of the MENA region. But this is also a, another bleak prospect because I think when it comes to Turkey's expansionist tendencies in Libya and in Northeast Syria and Mediterranean, and also in Northern Iraq, I think uh, they might not be uh, able to push back Turkey in all those fronts. Maybe they will be able to push them back, push Turkey back in some of those fronts. And it's it seems less likely that they will push back Turkey in Northern Iraq, uh, or maybe even in Northeast of Syria. So maybe Mediterranean and Libya has more kind of priority uh, in respect to uh, you know America and America's allies in, in Europe. So I will stop there. Thank you very much. And looking forward, obviously, to the discussions and the question and answer session. Thank you very much, uh, Shivan. Uh, I, I think you may have a point there. Uh, it does not seem that so many actors would be concerned with Turkish incursions 
uh, in the in the KRI in the north of Iraq, apart from, of course, rhetorical criticism that we hear from both Kurdish governments and uh, government uh, in Baghdad. But apart from that, you see more or less expansion of Turkish uh, Turkish presence uh, there and the boldness of their operations. Uh, uh, Aram, please, the floor is yours. Uh, please give us your uh, opening remarks. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Tomas. I'm glad to be here. Uh, Sajada and Shivan didn't left and anything for me to mention. Uh, those I will just focus on the challenges and promises facing uh, Kadhimi and his administration in Iraq. Uh, he inherited several uh, problematic uh, strat structural problem, problem, especially an economic problem. Uh, uh, those were uh, Syrian refugee crisis and plummeting oil pr uh, prices and also uh, had an employment among the especially uses and wars and dis displacement. Especially, uh, there was a huge wave of displacement from northern Iraq uh, in the north, north western Iraq to the northeast and southern Iraq and also ISIS, ISIS inclusion into the northern Iraq, which uh, basically created that, those displacement. Uh, I would like also to focus on the um, infrastructure, especially the energy infrastructure. ISIS damaged uh, an energy, Iraqi's ener energy infrastructure in the northern Iraq, which created a huge problem uh, in Iraq. Iraq already, faced a shortage in energy. And then they, by damaging the Beji um, uh, refinery, they, uh, they deepened that shortage in the energy. When uh, October protests happened and people demanded it to change the government, uh, there was a higher uh, rate of unemployment among users. That was the, one of the factors that lead to that protest. And it was a, one of the main factors that lead to change uh, the government and designate the Kazemi to become a prime minister in Iraq. He, uh, once he took the office, he, um, he, he faced, he had several challenges, including uh, appointing a new governor to the CBI, Central Bank of Iraq, and appointing a new chairman to the Popular Mobilization Forces. Uh, uh, in, uh, he overcomes those challenges, but there are several other challenges uh, he, um, he is still struggling with, um, including the diversification of economy. Um, he, put, uh, he, he, he took several baby steps to toward that um, direction by uh, voting on the white paper, which is a, a package of reform uh, to reform the Iraqi's economy and also uh, recover the stolen, Iraqi stolen asset and diversifying Iraqi's economy, uh, which I'm not sure whether we, he gonna be able to do it during his uh, term or not. And also, uh, he was able to appoint a new governor to the CBI. This, uh, this was a good step forward because uh, the, pro the former uh, governor of uh, CBI was in office uh, for a decade. And it was a necessary step to change uh, the governor uh, of CBI. And, um, Probably the new governor governor has a, a different financial policy or monetary policy in the Iraq, which in one point or another they have to address the um, exchange uh, exchange rate policy, Iraqi's exchange rate policy. Um, ever since that, uh, the uh, I mean after 2003, Iraqi's government. Uh, took the, or basically implementing the fixed exchange rate policy, which is one of the factors that 
the Iraqis uh, economy is not moving forward, especially in um, diversifying the Iraqis economy. Um, also, you know, one, one point in the future, he has to address the private sectors or um, private sectors issues in Iraq. Um, we are a renter state and uh, uh, people uh, depend on the public sector. And uh, due to the um, uh, uh, political parties uh, incentive or those political parties incentive who uh, took the power after 2003, uh, they created a network of patronage by depending on the public sector or hiring their uh, supporter and emphasizer uh, in, into the public sector or emerging them into the public sector, they uh, created the burden, burden on the public sector and they didn't leave any space for private sector to flourish and to grow. So in a one point in, uh, in a future, Kazmi has to uh, address that. Uh, address that and shrink the size of the government or shrink the size of public sector in order to, in a, uh, as a one incentive to uh, push or support the private sector. Uh, one thing that Kazmi also uh, is struggling with, I know that the US election has a, uh, the outcome of the U US election has a great influence on it is maintaining the balance of interest between Iran and US in Iraq. Um, as I mentioned, it, uh, ISIS uh, in a 2003, in, a, in a Operation 2003 for toppling down the Saddam Hussein in Iraq, uh, the war damaged the Iraqis' uh, uh, energy infrastructure. After that, despite all the efforts to rebuild it, uh, then uh, there was still a shortage in energy, electricity, and also the fuels. Uh, then ISIS came on, ISIS damaged the many refineries and oil fields in, in the Northern Iraq. And this deepened the uh, crisis. Uh, therefore, Iraqi, Iraq is independent, depending on the uh, energy imported from Iran. And it was the main issues, uh, the main issues discussed between the United States and Iraqis um, politician. Um, every now and then Iraq, uh, United States extended a waiver for, for Iraq to import the energy, 40% of energy from Iran. Then the Trump administration and uh, Mark Pompeo uh, put it, uh, an extra pressure on Iraq to become independent from Iran uh, by building an, a new uh, power planet in Iraq, which is uh, not feasible within a short period of time for Iraq. Despite all those pressure, Iraq uh, successfully maintained the mm, relationship between both parties, Iran and the uh, United States and uh, avoided to become a battleground for both uh, parties. Uh, if the Democrats take the administration in the United States, uh, they will have a soft approach toward Iran and this will uh, release some pressure on Iraqis politician here and especially Kazmi's administration if he stay in a power until the end of 2021. Thank you very much, uh, Aram, for your contribution. Uh, actually, thank you all. Uh, I'm sure we have um, we will have more than plenty of questions from the from the audience, but I'm gonna uh, utilize my uh, my right to have uh, I would say two short uh, questions. Um, the first one is related to uh, Mustafa Kazimi, who, uh, in my view, seems to be, of course, despite the hurdles and obstacles he's facing, and especially Sajad was saying that his track record is uh, 
we may say he struggles. It's not that much as he tries, uh, especially when it comes to rule of law, fighting corruption or limiting uh, limiting influence of uh, certain elements of uh, popular mobilization for this uh, Shabi. So my question for actually all three of you, what do you think is next for Kazimi? Is he working on staying in Iraqi politics big time? Is he working, for example, on creating his own electoral block or mustering support from some of the heavyweights, for example, Muqtada, uh, Muqtada Sadr, uh, so he can prevail even after the early elections? If we are going to have early elections, that's also the question. Uh, and my second question is, uh, what should we make of the contemporary situation or position of the popular mobilization forces, in particular uh, pro-Iranian elements? Uh, I'm speaking about uh, what the Washington Institute for the Near East Policy is often calling the special groups, uh, such as Qatayb Hezbollah. Because what um, my reading is, they are somewhat struggling to uh, maintain the influence they have. They have to modify their strategies. Uh, they have to establish new groups. They are increasingly targeted uh, by the US. Uh, but also it seems that uh, the prime minister is also trying to create, uh, let's say, more problematic life uh, for them. So I would like to ask, what's your uh, what's your take on that? Thank you very much. I think that's a question for all all th all, all three of you. Uh, I think you may you may have something interesting to add to it. I went first last time, so this time I'll give Shivan and Aram the chance to. to start. I was going to say let's go on the same order, but like, okay, I'm going to take the first question. I'm. Not sure I will be able to to make a, any 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 justice statement to your in, in regards to your uh, second question. But on the first one, I think uh, Mustafa Kazmi. My, my understanding and my impression is that Mustafa Kazmi has uh, emerged as a very strong compromise candidate uh, among the uh, main Shia blocs or blocs uh, in Baghdad, but also as a, a compromise candidate between between Erbil and Baghdad. Let's put it this way, assuming that there may have been some other candidates that uh, with the veto of the Kurds did not, uh, had, uh, did not get the luck to, be, to become a, a prime minister or to be successful in forming the government. I believe maybe one of the two candidates uh, that were nominated, uh, one of them uh, specifically failed, uh, maybe because the Kurds were not on board. But I think, Kazemi has emerged as a strong compromise candidate in Baghdad and also between Erbil and Baghdad. And certainly like some of the change that he has managed to push through uh, where uh, while obviously some of that is, is at the expense of the bigger political parties or coalitions, but some of them are also like, a, seems to be like a renegotiation that is taking place. And that's why he came to Erbil, he went to Soleimania, like, if he was not a, a persuasive or a compromising candidate between Erbil and Baghdad, he would not have been given that much kind of space to maneuver or like space to show that he's here to stay. And he's here as he's, for example, relentlessly trying to bring or rein control the militias or the border control in the south and in, in northwest and sorry, in the north and in the south. So he's trying to show that he wants to basically to be seen that he's uh, uh, pushing on all the fronts to to basically bring uh, under control whether it's the customer uh, 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 points or the the militias uh, in, in in the case of uh, some of the special groups that you've mentioned and I think he's definitely more ambitious than than his predecessor Adil Abdul Mahdi uh, uh, while he knows that he's a compromised candidate but he's uh, rather young and he's fairly articulate and he definitely has a very good uh, uh, communications team behind him that basically uh, create that, uh, that, that, that uh, image and apparatus for him that he's going to be uh, pushing for uh, more change and certainly even compete in the next elections uh, if needs be, whether on a, on a separate ticket, like having an, his own coalition, which I doubt 
that will be a very successful strategy like we have seen with Aydr al-Ibadi by basically running on, on a separate ticket rather than al Dawlat al-Iraq ticket. And uh, maybe he would rather push uh, himself as a kind of the pro-reform candidate that was seeming to be the case uh, uh, among some of the political parties uh, during the protest movements and just before striking uh, on the basically uh, on the Baghdad airport took place where basically it shuffled the cards. So I'll stop there and give my co-panelists a chance. Thank you, thank you, Shivan. So I, I will go second. Uh, in regard to your fair, first question, uh, all, as Shivan mentioned it, all indicator, all indicator shows that he is working on a staying on a political stage for a while. And he is preparing, um, I believe, I believe, this is my opinion, he's preparing a political blog or electoral blog for the next election, if it happens in the June, uh, which I believe it will postpone to the end of the 2020, uh, maybe it will take uh, 2021, maybe, maybe it will take in a, um, December 2021 or maybe next year, January 2022. Um, as um, one of those indicators was um, um, basically disarming the uh, militias uh, or uh, non-state actors. Um, uh, he, uh, uh, he made a move uh, in a green zone by arresting several of Hezbollah's uh, members. And um, that was sort of um, reflecting the uh, protester demand in the Tahrir Square. Uh, that move um, made him uh, sort of popular. And also um, when he decided to move north, northward to um, uh, push the hashed members uh, out of the border um, gates because they were a non-state uh, actors uh, who um, basically used uh, several tools to uh, generate a revenue from the border areas. Um, he was successfully, or I would say kind of, um, I, I, I wouldn't say successful, but he basically showed that he is willing to uh, push forward on that uh, direction. Also, he put extra pressure on the KRG for um, uh, sending the, the internal revenue or the revenue generated from the tax uh, taxes and also other sources of revenue inside the Kurdistan region the, uh, central, to the central government. So he is um, uh, making a show to prepare a ground for creating an electoral blog for the next election. Thank you very much, uh, Aram. So yeah, to just follow up quickly on on, uh, on both questions, I, I think um, I can reference a recent interview the Prime Minister did, um, where he mentioned that there is a lot of pressure on him to do more and to do it quickly, and he's very resistant to that because it will lead to essentially his government collapsing. If he does more, then that could be too much, and if he does it too quickly, then this could lead to his downfall. So that tells you two things: that number one, Kavami does not, you know, he's not uh, only head of a temporary government. He is trying to look at a longer term picture for him as a political career. He does not want his government to collapse soon or quick or, you know, even uh, towards the when the elections are supposed to be held. He wants potentially to stay on as long as possible. And so that's why he does not want to upset the political elite because he needs their support to remain in government. So any reforms that are too much then they will face resistance and he will want to avoid those. And doing too quickly, he wants to avoid that um, because he does not want to upset the population. 
So if, for example, um, he does reduce the size of the public sector, and he does that very quickly, that will upset the population. He will lose support. If he, for example, undertakes painful reforms with regards to spending, that will lead to loss of support amongst the public if he does it too quickly. So I think he's very worried about the political elite's view of him and his government, and he's very much worried about the popular opinion. When you put these two together, it, it doesn't make for a very um, you know, inspiring or very kind of uh, confidence building view of, of Calvin. It looks like somebody who's very much interested in the political side of things, who is not going to so dramatically change the situation in the country, who is really trying to protect his position as PM as much as he can, rather than trying to do some of the difficult, uh, tough choices and, and work in order to help the country move in a better direction in two, three, four years time. Instead, he's looking at very short term, very light touch measures which give a good image of Mustafa Kalmi, but actually really in reality don't really achieve that much on the ground. And so I think a lot of uh, people out there are now starting to wake up to this and say, well, what has he achieved? Okay, it's been now, you know, more than six months he's been in power. What has he actually done in this time? What has he achieved? Yeah, you know, we've heard some good speeches maybe, we've heard some, uh, some, some good words spoken in the press, some very, um, you know, PR-like uh, moves, but actually, in terms of improving Iraq's situation, he hasn't done much. And I think that um, situation will, will prevail with whatever issue he touches, whether it's the political, whether it's security, whether it's economy or so on. I think people will come back to this view of what has he actually done? What is he, what is he doing for the country? Yes, he's trying to build an image for himself, but it looks like he's just part of the same problem. He's from the political elite and he's going to behave in the same manner as the rest of them. He's not going to dramatically change them. And so that answers, I think, both of your questions, that he's not done enough and not done enough quickly. I think that the EU will probably continue into 2021. He does not want to upset the situation too much. So the status quo is likely to persist for some time. Thank you very much, uh, Sasha. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Shivan and Aram, for your uh, for your elaborate answers uh, to my questions. I have to say I'm satisfied. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and now I would like to ask uh, the audience. Uh, so please uh, raise your hands, uh, introduce yourself, and then uh, you can ask your questions and have your comments. So who wants to go first? All right, if I uh, can go first. Uh, thank you very much. I'm from the I'm from the institute, uh, uh, the same as Tomas is. Um, uh, I have a question regarding Iran. Uh, if you would look uh, on the longer term perspective, uh, let's say what is the trend and what is the trajectory of the Iranian influence uh, in Iraq? Uh, if, uh, if you can compare it five years ago, a year ago, now, and uh, where you think uh, it will be uh, in a year from now. Uh, so if you can comment on, uh, on, uh, on that, uh, uh, seeing the trend and uh, projecting the future. Thank you very much. Let's take one or two more questions and then we are gonna have a round of answers. So there are no questions from the audience. Uh, if I may. Uh, yes. Thank you. Hello, Eric Siegel speaking. Um, I'm the contributor of the news portal InfoCZ uh, and also working in the humanitarian affairs, uh, partly also in the area of Middle East. Thank you, gentlemen, for your insightful uh, presentation. Uh, I enjoy very much and thank for, uh, thanks to Tomas uh, Kavalek for organizing this. Uh, my question goes in similar direction, uh, maybe as the previous one. Uh, in terms of wishful thinking, what do you think uh, or what you would uh, suggest uh, would be uh, the best uh, posture the United States uh, should take in Iraq? Uh, let's say for the benefit of Iraqis uh, themselves. Uh, mainly uh, in the context of this uh, 
US-Iran confrontation, uh, which is probably not going to uh, disappear, although it might be a little bit escalated, uh, possibly. But uh, what would you say is the right US policy for, for Iraq? And uh, also looking back um, uh, on developments uh, this year, uh, when this US-Iran confrontation escalated, could you? Could you a little bit uh, be more specific uh, or descriptive of how it impacted uh, Iraq itself, uh, besides uh, what was in the news uh, in terms of, you know, firing the rockets, uh, of course, the assassination of General Soleimani and so on. Thank you very much. Uh, let's have one more question and then uh, start the first round of answers. Yes, Philip, yes. Hello. Um, first of all, I want to thank you to have this webinar. It's very quite interesting topic. Uh, my name is Philip Sommer and I'm working for AMO. And currently I'm writing my master thesis on geopolitics of Kirai. And I would like to ask you uh, more about Premier Kazimi. Uh, what are the reform plans that he is preparing? And uh, how does the Iraqi Kurds or KRG or the public perceive these reforms thank you that's my question wonderful let's get the let's get to the first round of answers uh, guys thank you well, well, who do you want to start first please go ahead sure no problem uh, no problem. So I think um, part of Eric's question uh, was linked to uh, Tomasz's question as well, um, with regards to you know, the trends and what has occurred in the last year and, uh, and the last couple of years with Iran and Iraq and what the future holds. I think there's some overlap there, so perhaps I'll try to combine them into one answer. Uh, with regards to, to Iran, Iran, it will always be involved in Iraq. There is a long border between the two. Iran has always been Iraq's neighbor and will always be Iraq's neighbor. That's not going to change. And Iran will always hold an interest in uh, maintaining good relations with Iraq or at least keeping a, a friendly government in Baghdad, some a government that is friendly to Iran's interests. Now, America may not always be interested in, in Iraq or Europeans may not always be interested or any other country, but Iran will always be interested, absolutely. That is the only certainty that we can have with regards to you know, countries that are involved in Iraq. Iran will always be at the top. And the trend has been that Iran has been solidifying uh, its level of involvement in Iraq. Uh, Pre-2011, because the Americans were based in Iraq, uh, Iranians were primarily interested, motivated in, Number one, having a government in Baghdad that is going to be friendly to American to Iranian interests. And number two, but probably the more important, forcing the Americans out of Iraq. They believe there was a danger there. And that was the limit of their involvement based on these two uh, agendas. Once that was achieved, once both of those points were achieved, the Iranians expanded the level of involvement in Iraq. They started to support businesses and started to involve, get involved in other sectors. They started to develop more and more uh, links with other political parties who traditionally had no links with Iran and, and so on. And they continued this posture after 2014. So at this moment in time, there is no political actor inside Iraq who is not in some form or other friendly or close or communicating at least with the Iranians or has some, some sort of agreements with them. And no other country can compete with that level of influence. And going forward, the Iranians want to maintain that. They don't want to back one horse or one side. They want to back 20 or 50 different horses or sides. And I think that posture for them brings them some sort of reassurance that whatever happens in Iraq, whatever happens in Erbil or Baghdad or elsewhere, there will always be friendly government forces or powers or political parties there to uh, protect Iranian interests and involvement in Iraq. Now, as you can see with the Americans, you know, one minute they're super interested in Iraq. They're so interested, they decide to invade. They decide to you know, send tens of thousands of troops and stay for so long. And then they're not so interested anymore. And then suddenly the vice president is in charge of you know, policy on Iraq and they disappear for a few years. 
Then they're forced to come back in. They don't really want to, but they're forced to come back in. And then now there's a president who says, you know, it's, we should have taken the oil. We spent too much money. Why are we there? We're, you know, we shouldn't be there. We need to come back again. So American foreign policy towards Iraq is, is up and down, whereas Iranian foreign policy is consistent. And no other country can compete with that. So if you're asking me what the trend is for the future, in brief, the trend will always, in my view, at the way things are at the moment, is that Iran will continue to play the most significant role of any country in Iraq and will do its best to continue to have as much influence on the Iraqi government as possible. It doesn't want to do it in a way which makes Iraq a proxy of Iran. That's a bad thing for Iran. They'll want to avoid that scenario because that opens Iraq up for sanctions. It opens up Iraq for potential military action. It also gives the, uh, you know, cuts Iraq off from the rest of the world. Iran doesn't want that. It wants Iraq to act as a conduit for its, for its influence, for trade, for its economy, for its ability to move into other countries and so on. So it doesn't want Iraq to become a proxy of Iran. But it wants it to be, you know, heavily influenced by Iran. And I think that that trend will continue for the near future. In terms of what happened, you know, in the last year on uh, specific on the specific part of um, Eric's question, yeah, I mean, once you know the uh, cycle of um, you know violence continued uh, in towards end of 2019, and the way this was started, obviously, you know, when um, Prime Minister Abdel Mahdi came to power, there was a when the elections in 2018 were resolved, the anti-US uh, parties became very, very powerful. They picked up a lot of seats, a lot of votes, and essentially they became the power behind the new government. And they have one of their principles, one of their um, political programs is forcing the Americans outside of Iraq. They don't want to see the closure of the embassy, so to speak. They want to see a reduction in the number of foreign troops um, to zero. They don't want any American troops stationed in, in, in Iraq. And this is also a, a, a policy agenda of the Iranian government itself. They do not want to see American forces inside Iraq, nor in the rest of the Middle East, but you know, specifically with regards to Iran. And while this point persisted, the tension began to increase because in 2018, towards the 2018, the rhetoric against America increased. And because President Trump um, you know, engaged in also anti-Iranian rhetoric, the level of tension increased. And then eventually, uh, it led to you know these small scale um, harassments or attacks on U.S. forces in several areas, and this continued continued until obviously you know you had an American contractor, American citizen killed uh, in in northern Iraq, and I think that's the concern was could have could that have been prevented? Was that a step too far, and so on? And the cycle continued after that. Then we saw you know uh, essentially a small siege outside the U.S. embassy, and then following that the assassination of. Asim Soleimani and Abu Mahdi Mohandes. The repercussions of all of this, as, as Shivan mentioned, has been the shuffling of the cards. Number one, you've lost Iran's key policymaker on Iraq, which is Qasem Soleimani. And there hasn't been a, a proper replacement for him in, in that role as the person who manages the Iraqi um, file for the Iranian government. That, that's, that's gone now. Number two, you've lost a key controller of the military groups, militias, anti-Iraq forces, Hajj al-Shabi, whatever label people want to apply, but these paramilitary groups, which now number over 50, the, the person that managed them, the person that was a sort of godfather for all of these, that kept some of these in line, that prevented you know clashes between the government and some of these forces, Mohandas, he has been assassinated. So nobody has replaced him. The level of tension and competition between these groups and leaders has increased. And then the third is that the Iraqi government was completely embarrassed. It was embarrassed by the fact that it had no control over security, airspace, sovereignty, ability to you know, prevent uh, you know, any of these sides from carrying out these disputes inside Iraq. The fact that the Americans undertook this operation on Iraqi soil without Iraqi approval was a flagrant you know, abuse of sovereignty, but the Iraqi government can do anything about it, just like it can't prevent the you know, Turks from carrying out their airstrikes in, in northern Iraq. I think that you know um, dealt a death blow to the the idea that Iraq could try to you know conduct a middle ground policy. It would prevent the Americans and the Iranians from fighting it out inside its territory. That was the policy from 2014 to 2018 under the Abadi government, and somewhat successful in, in maintaining that. But once you know the airstrike took place that killed Soleimani and Mohandas, you know that vision disappeared. It was no longer possible, and Iraq was going to fall on one side or the other. And I think it became very apparent to the, to the Americans that if forced to choose, the, Iraqis will, the Iraqi government, the Iraqi political elite will, be, will choose the Iranians over the Americans. They have to. 
Iran is the neighbor. American is not. America is here now, but it, it might not be in the future. And I think that made it very, very clear, which is why it kicked off this uh, strategic dialogue and the Americans wanting to make a you know, very clear relationship between the Iraqis and the Americans. What does America want from Iraq? What does Iraq want from America? And it's become apparent that there are some things, as uh, Aram mentioned, that Iraq is unwilling to do. It's unwilling to cut its economy off completely from Iran you know, uh, in, in, a, in a quick way, because it, it wants the benefit of maintaining good relations with Iran. And it not, not only just technically it's not feasible, it does not want to cut itself off from Iran. Iran is very important to Iran. And I think that made it clear to the Americans that, look, you're not going to get your way completely in Iraq. It's just not possible. So I think putting the immediate future together is dependent on three things. Number one, who becomes the president in the US? Number two, what happens with the Iranian presidential elections next year? What direction does Iranian policies, politics take? And then three, what happens with Iraqi elections next year? Put these three elements together, once we have the results from all of these, I think will give us a trajectory of uh, Iraq, UN, Iran uh, relations, uh, sorry, Iraq, US, Iran relations for the next maybe 10 years. Before, until then, I think there's going to be some, some of the status quo, some tensions, some potential military actions, uh, but not any clarity on the relationship until these three events are concluded. Thank you very much, uh, Sajat. Uh, yes, well, Shivan? I can add to uh, some of the points, uh, maybe from uh, from the Erbil's point of view and maybe some of uh, some other additional reflections on the uh, bringing the questions from both Thomas and Eric together. I mean, I, I, I definitely agree with the assessment uh, that Sajat has just made. I believe uh, the Kurdish political parties, and especially the main two parties, KDP and PUK, have also forged very good and and, and, and high level relations with Iranian uh, uh, regime or like Iranian authorities, be it in the government or the main political figures in, in, in Iran. And, and they certainly in, uh, I've been in meetings where basically um, uh, Kurdish officials have expressed uh, 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 sentiments that, well, we cannot tell what US uh, policy will be in Iraq after four years because it's election bound, but we know certainly what Iranians uh, want uh, in Iraq or for us in the Kurdistan uh, region. So basically, uh, the, 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 the uh, Iran gave, uh, basically offers the Iraqi authorities and Iraqi uh, uh, officials and Kurdish officials more certainty or like a long-term perspective in terms of planning and their engagement in, in Iraq and be it, uh, in, in on the level of security politics and also uh, economy. And that's why we have seen like after uh, after the the referendum and, and, and all the reverberations from the uh, Kirkuk uh, uh, events and all of that, that I believe uh, even KDP has now started to Forge very good ties with the Iran alliance main blocks that have emerged victorious or uh, more powerful, uh, especially after the uh, last parliamentary elections uh, in Iraq. Economically, Iraq has, I believe, just before the uh, lockdown and this economic uh, bust cycle, had 12 billion economic exchange with, with Iraq. And part of that is obviously with uh, at least one uh, part of Kurdistan region, which is uh, Suleimania. If, if Erbil has the benefit of a geographic location to have uh, a very uh, high or increased economic exchange uh, with Turkey, Suleimania province, which is basically the reality on the ground, they have closer uh, geographical uh, exposure to Iran. So they, they will not have that uh, benefit if they don't have uh, good relations. But again, I think the security situation has necessitated for both KDP and PUK to forge very good relations with the with the uh, uh, Iranian uh, uh, authorities. And I believe some of the actions that US has taken in Iraq, especially in recent years, has not been uh, basically putting uh, Iraqis interests uh, uh, in, in, in sight, especially like, for example, uh, with the security challenges that Iraq faced with the emergence of IS and the war against ISIS that Iran or Iranian uh, uh, officials like Soleimani were basically a, a, a unifying actor on the ground, leading the, the, the fight against, uh, against ISIS or bringing all different uh, segments of uh, Iraqi security forces together to, to, to wage that, that war. But 
but some of the actions of, of US, as I said, they are not putting the Iraqis' interests uh, into, into, into sight. And, and, and maybe it's more even not US interests that are prioritized uh, in, in some of these decisions. It's mostly some narrow partisan gains uh, from, from, from those decisions. And, and again, I think one thing that uh, we need to also mention that there is also a huge cultural uh, tie between Iran and, and, and Iran. Like if, if Iraq is going to need to diversify its economy, and obviously one of it is, is basically uh, tourism, religious tourism and ar archeological sites. And if people go to Saudi Arabia for pilgrimage, well then certainly a lot of uh, Iranians will obviously have to come to Iraq for pilgrimage. That's their uh, freedom of religious practice, and you cannot um, basically uh, uh, prevent them from that. So it's it's all in, in all in all, I believe. Uh, uh, I think that the best U.S. posture will be hopefully the next uh, president and the next uh, U.S. Uh, Iraqi government in Baghdad will have more in common and aligned interest vis-a-vis -vis Iran, and definitely someone that uh, gives more incentives to to Iran to basically uh, basically. Uh, Cut down some of its malign behaviors. If they, if I borrow this from uh, American officials, so basically a nuclear agreement or going back to the nuclear agreement or what is left of it would certainly maybe incentivize Iran to cut down some of these uh, malign behaviors. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Shivan. Uh, Aram, the the floor is yours. Oh, please ah, unmute okay. yourself. Well, I will, uh, I will just add a few comments to what Sajjad and Shivan said. Uh, historically, Iran and Iran were either on a good term or on a bad term. During the bad term, Iraq didn't do well. So um, uh, US pressure on, uh, on uh, Iraq to cut the tie with Iran is unrealistic because we are neighbor and we, we has been a uh, neighbor for a long time. Geographically, we cannot just basically cut the tie with Iran. Culturally, we cannot cut the tie with Iran. Religiously, we cannot cut the tie with Iran. Uh, but after uh, re-implementing the sanctions on Iran and assassination of Qasem Soleimani, uh, Iraq uh, worked as a live line for Iran. Uh, the crippling sanction on Iran basically uh, uh, forces the Iranian um, authorities to find the loopholes and ways to circumvent the sanctions. And the, the best places to do that was, uh, is Iraq and still is Iraq. Was Iraq and still is Iraq. And uh, in, a, in a one way or another, the Iraqi authority has to allow this uh, to happen. Because um, Iraq, can, Iraq cannot uh, depend on itself uh, economically. Um, and also Iran, besides that, uh, Iran will, wants to maintain its uh, road to uh, Mediterranean Sea. And the only place is Iraq. So um, as you can see, the, the interest is intertwined. Iraqi's interest and Iranian interest inter, is intertwined. So um, again, US's pressure to cut the tie with Iran is unrealistic. Uh, we are a neighbor with Iran and also uh, there is a lot of um, uh, inter, our economic interests overlap it. And also as Shivan said, we have a cultural tie it's not, we cannot basically cut those ties with Iran. Thank you very much, uh, Aram. Uh, now let's start another uh, round of questions. I have one from, uh, from our chat. Uh, the question is uh, uh, whether we should expect uh, some form of, uh, I would say expanded cooperation between the KRG, uh, and here I would say mainly the KDP and Turkey regarding, uh, regarding the PKK. Uh, I think this question is uh, kind of touching upon the fact that recently uh, there has even been some uh, 
infighting between some of the Peshmerga forces and some of the PKK forces in uh, in Ahmedi area uh, in, in Duhuk province. So if you could elaborate on that. So that's the question number one. And uh, now, are there any other questions from the audience, please? No more questions? So in, the, in that case, uh, if there are no more questions from the audience, uh, I have a question of my own. Um, I think uh, Shivan touched upon that a bit already, and that's the disputed territories between uh, between the Kurdistan government and, and between Baghdad. Uh, what we see recently, a couple of weeks back, is the brand new agreement about sharing uh, sharing power or sharing governance over the Sinjar district in uh, in Nineveh we were also uh, we are also hearing renewed discussion about increased coordination in form of some you know joint operations room between the Iraqi security forces and the Peshmerga and Diyala province and uh, and perhaps even in uh, in Kirkuk despite that this on the table, as we all know, for a long time and never moved that much uh, forward in the recent years. Uh, so my question is, how should we read that? Uh, is it, let's say, a prelude to resolving the issue of, uh, of disputed territories? Should we expect more cooperation and political security level? Should we expect Peshmerga to return to some of those territories as part of the agreement? Uh, so that's question number two. I'm going to give uh, the audience uh, a chance one more time. Uh, is there any question or comment that uh, you might want to put out there? OK, gentlemen, so uh, please uh, answer. I think uh, I think Shivan may elaborate on disputed territories as, as it was his uh his specialty uh with the, within the usip uh for quite some time I'm, I'm happy to 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 take a go um to have a to have a go at it i mean honestly with regards of the return of peshman to the spirit territories i'm not so sure about that uh maybe sometimes here and there we see uh claims about the nature of uh, these uh, ongoing meetings and negotiations when especially when we see um uh, uh, delegations from the Ministry of Defense or Ministry of Peshmerga meet in Erbil or in Baghdad. But I think um, the, the, the main point here or the importance of this kind of uh, reestablishing this co uh, coordination uh, uh, cooperation mechanism, which was in place uh, uh, to, 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 to a long uh, extent before the uh, referendum and before the reverberations from it, basically, it's to basically ensure that uh, the security forces of Iraq, the Ministry of Defense, and the security forces of of KRG, uh, the Ministry of Peshmerga, they are coordinating their security planning, exchanging uh, intelligence, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, vis-a-vis the spirit territories. These are from one side areas that need to be managed or controlled or managed by security forces that belong to the KRG and from the other end, security forces that are more or less under the uh, command and control of uh, uh, government of Iraq's uh, security structures. And I don't wanna go into whether Peshmerga will, re will return to Kirkuk or they will return to Sinjar and all of that. I think that's a bit uh, pre-hyped, I would say, but it is important for the security actors, both in Erbil and Baghdad to work together in uh, basically uh, overseeing the security uh, file and structure of these disputed territories and including Kirkuk. Unfortunately, we, we still have uh, uh, from time to time an uptake in, in one can call it insurgent attacks from IS or the remnants of IS, or I don't know, because uh, the reach from uh, Iraqi government or Kurdish government to some of these territories are not in full fledged. So we, we have, I would say, territories that are, one can call it ungoverned spaces and ungoverned territories. And these are uh, quite heinous uh, incidents sometimes, like we have seen a couple of weeks ago with the incident in, in I believe, uh, in uh, near Samarra, where basically uh, a lot of, I would say, about a 10 or a dozen uh, Sunni young men were, were basically 
beheaded, I don't know, they were in, in a very abhorring way uh, uh, killed. And this basically can, can have uh, uh, huge ramifications if there is no good uh, collaboration between different security actors uh, in preventing some sort of uh, similar sorts of or nature of, of incidents because there is always, I would not say uh, appetite, but I would say there is always uh, uh, basically room there for a renewed conflict and new fault lines have emerged since the war against uh, IS. So you would rather have good coordination on the security side rather than uh, having these uh, incidents to basically uh, expand to uh, all out, I don't know, ethnic sectarian conflicts, because that's the last thing that the Iraq and Iraqis want, to be honest. Thank you, Shivan. Gentlemen, Sajat uh, and Aram, do you want to add uh, something? I, I believe the uh, deal between the uh, KRG and central, Bag central government of Baghdad on the Sanjar area was sort of uh, trying to ease in a, cons a Turkish concern uh, in the, the region, and especially regarding to the presence of uh, PKK element in the Sinjar. Uh, the, the, I think it was a move to eliminate uh, any excuse for Turkey to move uh, forces to that region. Uh, uh, or move uh, forces southward than Duhok and Erbil. Uh, in a regard to, to the PKK, KDP, Peshmerga skirmish, um, the tension arises after PKK took a credit for um, exploding a pipe, oil pipeline, transferring uh, KRG oil to Jihan port. Uh, which is KDP sees, is, sees it the main source of revenue for uh, funding KRG's government. And um, they were preparing the ground. I, I believe it's uh, besides that, there is some sort of pressure on the KDP uh, to um, push uh, PKKs out of the villages towards the mountain from the Turkey. And this push uh, lead to um, KDP's mobilize its force toward the PKK's position, which uh, lead to this skirmish in those area. Thank you. Ajat, please. Yes, yeah, sure. uh, I think, I'm probably going to look at a slightly bigger picture here. Um, I don't want to focus on individual things like the Sinjar Agreement, like the dispute between the PKK and, and, and KDP, like the uh, in dispute in internal boundaries and the presence of you know, federal forces in the Peshmerga and Hajj al Shabi and you know, the security gaps that occur. Are, the bigger picture is as long as Iraq continues to be governed in this divided way, then these problems will persist. There'll be new ones the same ones will come back again, the developments will change from where they are into something just as bad. So you have, just in the Kurdistan region, you have the KDP, so one part of the Kurdistan region is governed by one party, and it has an armed force, the KDP Peshmerga. And the KDP itself is not united because it has two wings of the same family. So Masrur on one side, Nishrul on one side. And then you have in the PUK, the same scenario. You have two brothers and a cousin on one side and the other, and they also have the armed force. And then you move further south, the same problem. The parties split up into two or three. And Shia parties that have armed groups who are combating the same government that their parties are part of. And the same, you know, across the board. While we have this scenario, you will have the presence of the PKK. You will have the presence of these, you know, armed groups, Shia militias, whatever you want to call them. You will have Iran exerting its influence, Turkey exerting its influence. America exerting its influence, and you will continue to see Iraq suffering, you know, in, in, in all parts, wherever this problem persists. And that's where terrorism breeds, and that's where, you know, the, the politics becomes broken. And that's where we have weak foreign policy and weak domestic policy. Until we resolve this, until we actually have a truly um, not representative government, but also a, a truly functioning government, somewhere where 
and, and that protects the rights of citizens. We, we can continue to have uh, an autonomous Kurdish region. We don't need to have a strong government in Baghdad that says, right, no, we're going to break up the KRG. There's no need for that. You can continue to have a strong federal government and strong local government. In fact, that's exactly what you need. Federal government can't do everything. It needs to rely on local, strong local governments. At the moment, we have a weak local government and we have a weak federal government. And then that's why these gaps persist. So, you know, I, I don't think the Sinjar agreement will be fulfilled in my personal view. I don't think we will have any clarity on the future of Kirkuk anytime soon. I don't think the Hajj al-Shabi will be going away and, you know, the associated problems will disappear. And I don't think the infighting inside every party and between every party will actually disappear, whether in Kurdistan region or the rest of Iraq. And while that persists, you'll have all these other elements in play. So. For the short term, I, I just don't see how we can try to deal with these long-standing issues just by saying, oh, you know, let's have an agreement on Sinjar or maybe say to the PKK, you can't operate here or actually say to X and Y, Qatar, Hezbollah, whatever, you can't be here, you need to move somewhere else. That's just not, you know, that's not how you actually run a state and, uh, and how a government is supposed to behave. And that weakness at the heart of the post-2003 order is what's led to Iraq to this situation today. And unless we resolve it, will lead to the same scenarios going forward. Weak post-2003 order will lead to continued small bits of chaos in every part of Iraq. Uh, thank you very much. Shivan, I see you are raising your hand. Uh, do you want to add something? Yes, I just wanted to use that yes. beautiful feature uh, feature as well. No, I <laughs> certainly agree with, with 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 what Sajad said, and I definitely think in the long run, or even in the medium run, if you want to basically overcome all the crises, whether it's economic, politics, or security that Iraq is made in, it's basically you need to have a structural overhaul of how politics is governed, how basically you need institutions to to lead rather than. Uh, not even political parties sometimes, but even individuals within the political parties. I was certainly, I was certainly uh, this morning contemplating by basically all this uh, on the skirmishes between KDP and and and, and PKK, and I was like, okay, I know now what uh, what that official said and what that uh, political uh, party member said, but I don't know what the uh, what the minister of Peshmerga in Erbil said and. They are supposed to be the ones that are in in, in charge of the of the security, and and that's definitely uh, the, the the challenge, uh, whether it's in Iraq proper or whether it's in Erbil or it's between Erbil and Baghdad. We need institutionalization. We need uh, unification and professionalization of security forces. You cannot have political parties in Erbil that have armed forces, or you cannot for sure have armed forces that have MPs and political parties, which can be said uh, in the case of some political parties in Iraq. You need a civil military, a sound mil a civil military structure in place where uh, basically uh, political partisanship doesn't weigh in into security decisions, which is uh, the case in, 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 in Kurdistan or in, in the rest of Iraq, even when it comes to the disputed territories. Like, okay, there is a constitutional article when someone might say well but that's expired already but well whether it's expired or not i don't think again there will be it will be prioritized anytime soon but we cannot uh, come into basically making decisions about these disputed territories uh, in the for example narrow interests of political political parties in erbil or in baghdad we need to basically leave this for uh, the local structures in place or Structurals in the federal level or in, in, in on the on the uh, autonomous level of, of KRG, but I'm afraid the problem is both in Erbil and Baghdad when it comes to long-term governance, uh, there is no space for long-term planning. Like for example, it's it's a government of crisis management for for uh, Prime Minister Academy. Like definitely there needs to be diversification. There needs to be a lot of structural changes, but the problem of uh, most of uh, Iraqi governments uh, are inheriting this. Uh, the, the problem is that they don't have time, uh, and, and which is of the essence, to plan for these structural change. It's more like short-term adjustments, crisis management, which I believe, despite the fact that KRG or the Kurdish parties had a lot of uh, kind of space and margin of error, but they also uh, failed uh, spectacularly to to plan ahead for some of these structural challenges and changes that needs to be uh, taking uh, taking place. 
Thank you very much, uh, Shivan. Uh, our time is almost coming to an end, so I will give one last chance uh, to the audience if you have one, two questions or short comments. Anybody? Well, if not, uh, I think your uh, last uh, statements were kind of summing it up. Um, nothing is easy it's hard to predict uh, and we shouldn't expect uh, miracles solutions anytime soon for the issues that the iraqi system has uh, and were deepening since 2003 suddenly with al Qasimi's government uh, in a year or half a year uh, gentlemen uh, thank you very much for participating uh in uh, this webinar thank you very much uh, for your great contributions and great discussion uh, i would also like to uh thank uh, to the audience for attending and also having interesting uh, interesting questions uh for the for the debate so uh without further ado ladies and gentlemen thank you very much uh, for attending uh, the event and hopefully uh, we are going to see each other soon uh, in person not necessarily uh, via zoom due to the uh, due to the covid crisis thank you very much and uh, goodbye thank you for having